literally, I've been in a uniform mm -hmm. since I was 17. Mm -hmm. uh, and then transitioned into becoming a police officer. Uh, so, you know, there's so many things I could say, like who I am. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm flawed. I, you know, I'm human. I, I make mistakes. Um, I try to learn from those. But, um, you know, I'm just right now who I am today is someone who's still trying to become better every day. When did you realize that you had a calling for law enforcement? Was it at the age of 17? Yeah, it was before that. Okay. Um, my my background as a child was sorted. You know, I, I come from a family who um, was on the other side of law enforcement, mm -hmm. prison, uh, drug addiction, things like that. I used to see police officers uh, growing up way before the age of 17. Uh, and, and I was drawn to the uniform at first. Mm -hmm. I, I thought it would look sharp and the gadgets. And this may sound silly, but I used to watch the, the, the old um, series, Batman, not the cartoon, but the actual, uh, you know, scripted series Correct. with Robin and their scale in the building. But they had all <laughs> these, they had a belt with all these little gadgets. And I kind of likened that when I would see a police officer with all these gadgets. And I started to pay attention. And then even when I was growing up, I could see... I could differentiate between bad police officers, good police officers, just by their behavior. Mm -hmm. But what resonated with me were the police officers who I had encounters with who were very nice and very courteous and were helping people. Uh, didn't know at that time that's what I wanted to do, uh, but I kept feeling I was drawn to that. Um, my progression went somewhere else from the military to work on aircraft, fighter jets in the military, uh, and then the natural progression would be to go into the civilian world mm -hmm. and make some money. Mm -hmm. But that kept nagging at me at the back of my, back of my head all the time. When did your career start for um, working with the Atlanta Police Department? So that was 1995. Okay. I, was, I was working for Delta Airlines, uh, fixing big jets. Um, and I was thinking, God, I hate this job. Mm -hmm. So when you're fixing airplanes, the last thing you want to do is hate what you're doing. Correct. You know, you don't want to have an extra boat laying around and be like, I just don't need this anymore, just throw it away. I mean, you gotta, <laughs> right. be, you gotta be dedicated to this. And I realized this is probably not for me. Mm -hmm. And I started thinking back about becoming a police officer. I was making great money. Mm -hmm. My son at the time uh, had just been born uh, in 95 and I made that transition. And when I became a police officer, I literally took a 75% pay cut. And people thought I was insane. That's a huge pay cut, sir. Huge, huge. Uh, and to get to Delta Airlines, as an aircraft technician is like getting to the NBA if you're a basketball player. Mm. It was the creme de la creme of airlines. Mm -hmm. uh, so my coworkers thought I was absolutely insane. Uh, but I knew I was making the right decision. I was anxiety upon anxiety with a, with a newborn, thinking how I'm gonna make it. Um, and it was a struggle at first, but I knew right away uh, it was what I was meant to do. Yes, sir. Um, from your past experience um, in, law, in law enforcement in ATL, why do you think there's so much crime in Atlanta at the present time? Yeah, well, you know, I get asked this question a lot. I, I don't know that Atlanta is off the charts in crime. I can think of other cities like Memphis. Mm -hmm. I know for a fact that they're, the police chief of Memphis is a friend of mine. Uh, absent of what recently happened with the death of this young black man at the hands of these police officers, way before that, their homicide rate was double what Atlanta's was, and, and I think the population is similar. However, Atlanta has experienced an increase in crime, and I think what's happened uh, post-COVID, mm. post-George um, uh, post, uh, Floyd, where there was a push for social justice reform, much needed, and I think with the protests here, especially in 2020, uh, police officers being held more accountable, I think what happened was it was a combination of people uh, expressing themselves and then bad actors integrating in these peaceful protests and committing crimes. And then police officers taking a step back and, 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 and rightly so in some instances, but being less proactive, which is, a, which is a formula for an increase in crime. That's my personal opinion. Mm -hmm. Some other experts may have a different opinion and say it's because of the economy. There may be a factor into that. I'm not an economist. Uh, I'm a street guy. Mm -hmm. I know what crime is. I work the streets of the city. I could see uh, the differences in how police re responded and reacted when I was on the force compared to today. We just got body cameras. The, the entire Atlanta Police Department within the last couple years 
was equipped with body cameras, where other departments have had them for years. I'm a proponent of body cameras. It, hold, it holds police officers accountable. And I think what's happened uh, is this combination of, if you want to include the economics and perhaps a pre-recession, mm -hmm. uh, the increase in people being able to speak their minds, mm -hmm. peacefully protest, and then bad actors say, hey, this is an opportunity for us to get in there and commit these crimes while the police are kind of taking a step back and being a little more um, open to understanding what the peaceful protests are about. I think those, those, that combination uh, basically is just a big soup mm -hmm. of crime that has caused the crime to increase in the city. Do you think um, the transplants, um, our you know, great brothers and sisters and from all different cities coming into Atlanta, from, let's say, Louisiana, Chicago, Detroit, um, Ohio, just from all over um, within the past, let's say, 15 years. Has that played any kind of factor into maybe the crime rate? So there's, there's two data points that I know have increased crime. 2005, Hurricane Katrina. Yep. Uh, in New Orleans, a lot of people transplanted here in Atlanta, and our crime rate increased significantly. Mm -hmm. In the summer of 2020, we were if not the only first city to open up from the, from the pandemic, it may have been another city, but I think we were the first city to open up. So what we saw was a lot of people coming here from other cities because now we have restaurants are open and nightclubs are open. People have been locked up in their houses for so long that we saw all these people coming to our city and the crime increased significantly overnight um, because Atlanta wanted to jumpstart the economy here. So those two things, and I think that still resonates today, especially yep. from 2020. We're only three years outside when we open up from the pandemic. Yes, sir. Uh, and I think we're still dealing with the effects of that. Yes, sir. As a community, what can we do to lower crime in our neighborhoods and cities? I, I think that, that's a tough question for me sometimes because when, when we say community, we have different communities in the city. Yep. We're in Buckhead, right? Yep. There's crime here. But what you, do, what you hear is people complaining about crime in Buckhead. Correct. But there's way more crime in Southwest Atlanta for the citizens who are, you know, living on a, on a meager income, who may have one beat police officer, beat cop, working a beat, but now he's got to work three other beats at the same time because they don't have the staffing to cover that. So when this woman calls 911 because she hears a prowler in her backyard and the police don't respond for three hours, I have to weigh that with, someone in Buckhead complaining because their bicycle was stolen. I get it. Crime is crime. Um, so I, to decrease crime, the numbers of police officers on, on the street of Atlanta have decreased significantly. Mm -hmm. When I was on the police department, we got almost up to 2,000. I talked to a police officer the other day. He said the numbers are down to 1,200. Meanwhile, the population of our city all over and all sectors of our city has increased significantly. So we have more people living here. We have more people coming into the city every day, Monday through Friday for business, and we have almost 800 less police officers than when I was on the police department. Mm -hmm. So I would start with having a robust recruiting effort for police officers, mm -hmm. good police officers mm -hmm. from all over the nation to come and, and work here and live here. And then also partner with the community. I mean, I don't know that, it, and I love the mayor. He's done a significant uh, turnaround in trying to be more engaged with the community. He has town hall meetings. We need more of that on the local level, not from the mayor himself, but mm -hmm. from like the precinct commander mm -hmm. in each zone of the city, zone one through six, being more engaged with the, with the business and the civic leaders of that community. The rec centers, the churches, the clergy, uh, people who are, are activists, people who have you know, a million followers on Instagram that talk about social justice reform. That's a good platform for somebody to say, hey, look, how do we as a community come together uh, and, and here's the thing, like, if you see something happening, say something. The old saying, see something, say something. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't want to get involved because of retribution. So come up with plans that make people feel empowered and safe when you want to report crime. Um, and I think the mayor's working on that, but I think the trickle-down effect, we haven't seen that yet. Yes, sir. Um, can we switch gears for a second and Certainly. talk about Velasquez Consultants? Sure. When I retired from the police department, I started a consulting business. Yep. 
Uh, and then within that consulting business, mainly what we do is do expert witness work. Uh, so what I've used is my, my experience as a homicide detective in death investigations to, to go into the civil side of things. Whereas someone is murdered at an apartment complex and they have inadequate security. Uh, and the family of the deceased mm -hmm. realizes that, you know, had they had more or increased security, uh, perhaps my loved one would still be alive today. So then they file, a lawyer files suit on their behalf mm -hmm. and they may sue the owners of the complex, the management company, if there was a security company there, I would come in and do an evaluation and say, the security program was either inadequate or it was sufficient uh, and give the attorney or that client a, a, a good, honest assessment of what kind of case they may have. Mm -hmm. And that, that goes everywhere from depositions all the way to court. Um, so the so same trial I may have, like, if I was having a criminal case. Yes, sir. Go on. We do that. We do training. Um, we do consultation on criminal investigations where uh, a family or a lawyer could hire me uh, if they were, you know, dissatisfied with the investigation of the death of their loved one. I could come in and give advice on what I think the police department didn't do right, could do better, uh, and further steps to help solve that case. Yes, sir. Um, with over 500 death, death investigations, um, does that play on your, your psyche? Like, how do you handle that? So that's a lot of death investigations, you know? Um, do you sleep well at night, sir? I sleep great. Yeah. I mean, if I don't sleep well, it's because my shoulder and my knee hurts. <laughs> I'm getting yeah. older. Um, and, and I have always, I've always uh, found a way to make sure that I turn that off. Mm. I had to raise a son. I had, you know, other responsibilities because even, you know, you could work all day, but you have to be there. You have to be present for your family and your yep. friends and everything else that's going on. There were times when I, I couldn't sleep, and it wasn't because of the faces that I'd seen. It wasn't mm. because of the crime scenes that I experienced. And I've seen some horrific, horrific imagine. crimes in, involving elderly, children, um, you name it. I've seen it. Everything you could imagine that you've seen in every horror movie, I've been there. I've seen it. But what kept me up sometimes at night was not turning off this investigative mind. I used to keep a notepad next to my bed because sometimes when I'm on the killer's trail, and I'm getting close to him, and it's this cat and mouse, and I'm like, oh, now I got you. Now I know who you are. Next steps, and I'd go to bed, and I'd start dreaming about things. And sometimes in a dream, a clue or a process may come to mind. I would literally wake up, and you know how dreams are. You wake up, five minutes later, you can't yep. remember them. Right. I would have to write it down. And when I wake up, I'm like, oh, okay, phone records, cars, registration. Let's just check his Google account, things mm -hmm. that came to me in my sleep. That didn't happen a lot, but that is what would keep me up. Other than that, I slept fine because I know the next day I had to start again yep. and I had to put in another 10, 12, 15 hours, whatever the day you know, happened to be. Yes, sir. Um, but for the most part, I slept great. ATL Homicide. Hey. Season four now? We're in season four. Um, let's talk about that experience. How Certainly. was that for you, sir? ATL Homicide, the show, is something that myself, my partner, David Quinn, um, Angeline Hartman, her name used to be Angeline Carrera. She used mm -hmm. to be a reporter for Channel 5, mm -hmm. covered crime. Uh, and some other folks that worked on the old show, America's Most Wanted, some producers, because we had worked on that show as well. We came up with this idea that what if when we retire, we tell our stories, but we wanted, we wanted to do it in a way that was respectful to the victims, to the families. Um, the show Although we are the narrators and the show is about me and my partner, David Quinn, in our cases, we don't feel like it's really about us. We feel it's about our victims because many of our victims, if not the majority of them, were people who came from disenfranchised neighborhoods, people who were down on their luck, prostitutes, crackheads, drug addicted people, uh, homeless people who, you know, for the most part, mainstream media doesn't really care about. You don't hear stories about that. Mm -hmm. So when we tell our stories, we always try to show those victims in, in the favorable light who they really were. When we talk to the families and they say, look, yeah, he had his problems. He slept on the streets. He did drugs, but he was a good brother. He was a good uncle. He still would come home, uh, you know, for Christmas and he would cook the turkey and he would do these things. So we try to make sure that we incorporate that in the story. People like true crime. People want to mm. go on this ride with us from, you know, when we showed up at the crime scene until we solved the case. Yes, sir. We're in season four. Uh, 
actually tomorrow we kickstart the second part of season four with 10 new episodes. Okay. Um, so that'll be 62 hours of TV that we've had already. And we just felt incredibly blessed to be able to tell these stories. Um, we, you know, the, the story, the, the way these stories unfold on TV, we narrate it and then there's actors that play us who do the recreations and we take the viewer on this roller coaster ride of how we solve the case. All the twists and turns that we had to do, the, you know, the sleepless nights, you mm -hmm. know, the travel, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the chasing these people to the finally to where we get these people in, in the interview room. And, and lastly, one of the, one of the, I think the most confusing parts of this whole thing that people really are unaware of is we realize that when someone is murdered, it, it, obviously that's tragic that this person's life ended their family has been affected. And then the person that killed them and their family is affected. Mm -hmm. Our victims' families had to get used to us going to trial after the case is solved and walking to the courtroom to testify and shaking hands with the defense attorney. Because mm -hmm. to them, they're the enemy, but they're not the enemy. Because those defense attorneys was on another case we had last year. And that defense attorney may turn in their client on the next case mm -hmm. or have information on another case and they, they have a client that has information that wants to proffer. So we make sure that we show respect and love to everybody because even the person that committed the murder, their family lost that person for life. They're never coming out of prison. So that's one thing we also show in the show is the compassion for both sides. You know, we just follow the truth. It's like a compass, it always points north. It always points towards the truth and that's just the way we go. Mm -hmm. You think in the near future we might see you on a good CSI, uh, some you know, we're working on some things. I can uh, dig it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, we're working on some things right now. We got some um, irons in the fire trying to see how we could, you know, uh, move this, you know, this experience of our careers into another direction. So, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, you know, we'll see. We'll see yeah, how that yeah. unfolds. I can't really see anything else right. because it's in, the, it's in the infancy stage of it. But uh, we have made some movements. So things are looking looking good in that direction. We're going to speak it into existence. You, you're there, sir. There we go. Trust and believe. Go. Um, you subscribe to a certain tier of style and fashion. Um, what's your favorite brand, sir? You know, I don't have a brand. Really? Like, I, you know, like, I don't, I've had two custom suits in my entire life, mate. That's it. And one was because I, I did the, I, I just was agreed to be in the magazine for this uh, particular um, designer. Okay. Uh, and the other one I actually paid for. What I realized is that for me personally, and I'm not knocking anybody has bespoke clothing or ties and suits and get custom made uh, whatever shoes, I could buy a suit off the rack from Macy's and just drop and another hundred dollars yep. and make it work for me. Yep. Uh, I wore a suit every day for 17 years. I was in homicide for 17 years, mm -hmm. suit and tie every day. Uh, I will admit, if you go back to my day one, I probably look crazy. Because I had my suit was too baggy. I didn't know what I was oh, doing. I had the baggy suits. I had the, the wide legs. And, you know, uh, I've seen <laughs> photos and I'm like, wow, I actually put that suit on. Uh, but as time went on, I realized that, hey, you know what? Why am I going to go spend all this money in an expensive suit? Mm -hmm. And I've got to wear the suit every day. And for us, you know, we're wearing suits around decomposed bodies. We're wearing suits around blood. We're wearing suits around. So, you know, I'd go buy a $150 suit, drop another 100 on it. Get and get it tailored, yep. and I'm good to go. Yep. yep. Got a favorite fragrance? Uh, Creed. Creed Aventus. The Creed guy, huh? Yeah. Creed Aventus is my, is my go-to. I've heard about it. Um, yeah. I'm MFK. Okay. Lockerot, 742. Yeah. That's my swag now. That's nice. That's nice. I've smelled it. I tried it. It just didn't stay on me right. Just, you know, cologne is, uh, it either hits with your pheromones or it don't. It smells good, and Got two it. minutes later, or five minutes later, I can't smell it anymore. It's gone. Got it. So they yeah. have a huge line of it, right? And I think you should definitely try some of the other um, okay. fragrances they are. It's amazing. Sounds good. I'll yeah. try that for what sure. What advice do you have for um, anyone that probably wants to get into law enforcement, um, wants to do better for their community, want to help with crime and just being the best that they can be, sir? So you just hit the nail on the head. That's If you find somebody that wants to do better for the community, that wants to help people and wants to be a police officer, then follow that passion. What I tell people is never become a police officer because you need a job. Mm -hmm. Never become a teacher because you need to get paid. Go pick up trash, go bartend, right? Go do something you could probably make a lot more money. Mm -hmm. Bartending, waiting tables, mm -hmm. 
become an artist, but if you become a police officer because you just need a check, you will not be successful. And you will not treat the people in this community the way they need to be uh, treated because mm -hmm. you're this there to get paid. Uh, and I've ran across people like that. I've worked with people like that, that just, you know, or people who just think it's cool. Like, I want to be a cop because, you know, I want to wear the uniform. Uh, and there's some truth to people who got picked on in school and they become cops and then they be themselves become the bully. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and I've seen that and there's no room for that. You know, they, you know, if you are going to be a police officer, you have to understand that you have to do this job every day and sometimes you're not going to get thanked for it sometimes you're going to get spit on screamed at cussed at and you got to take that on the chin go home and wake up the next day and do it again but try to do it better mm -hmm. Info. we thank you for everything that you've contributed to law enforcement to the community um everything you're doing in media the consultancy um just everything that you are sir we appreciate, appreciate you. You know, welcome to members only. The best is yet to come for all of us. Thank you. We got a lot of great things coming down the pipe, and we definitely want to keep you and your brand involved as much as possible. I'm looking forward if to it. If there's anything we can do to add value, we're here for you, sir. Much appreciated. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you. you, brother. Yes, sir.